at least different perspectives converging on some agreement on this panel, which is which is nice for a change, you know. <laughs> Thomas, uh, is anything happening? Uh, I uh, realize I have forgotten to click one button, so now hopefully now, it will. Now, and now it's live. Different Perfect. perspectives converging on some agreement. Um, okay, so I think we can officially start. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the panel on whether uh, the sanctions on Russia work. Uh, this has been uh, an ongoing policy debate and question ever since Russia invaded Ukraine back in uh, 24th February this year. Um, and especially in, uh, in, in the last few months, um, the sort of a general public conception was that actually they are not working. Russia uh, is earning a lot of money on gas and oil. Ruble is uh, stronger than ever. Uh, so why do we even bother? Um, or maybe actually this is not the case that sanctions are not working. So uh, maybe actually they do work. Uh, and that's something we want to discuss uh, in detail today. Um, and uh, for this, I would like to welcome uh, our four guests. Uh, first, uh, Professor Feld uh, from Yale School of Management, and uh, beforehand also Harvard Business School. Uh, I look at his publication record, and it would take an hour to, to discuss it in detail. Uh, so I just want to mention that he also wrote some books, uh, for example, Heroes Farewell. Um, so I would like to welcome Professor Zanenfeld here as our main speaker. Uh, we also have three panelists, um, uh, uh, Professor Benjamin Moll from London School of Economics, um, who's interested uh, in macroeconomics, inequality, and uh, how um, heterogeneity on micro level uh, corresponds or has effects on the macro level. Uh, so welcome, Professor Moll. Uh, we also have um, uh, now already Professor Lukas Rachen uh, from uh, University City London, uh, he also has been uh, in Princeton before and a visiting scholar at Harvard University, uh, as well as a researcher at uh, Bank of England, uh, so a real policy one, so to say. And he's interested in economic growth, labor market, how all of these things come up with uh, inequality, wealth and income. And finally, uh, unfortunately, a little bit late because of uh, technical issues, will join us Professor uh, Timothy Milovanov, is currently at University of Pittsburgh as well as a, a head of the Kiev School of Economics. And beforehand, he uh, also was a researcher at Bonn uh, and Penn, Pennsylvania universities. And most importantly, uh, uh, he can give us insight into the Ukrainian side of the story because he has been a minister of trade, uh, uh, sorry, minister of economic development and trade of Ukraine uh, between 2019 and 2020 as well as a founder of a group called uh, Vox Ukraine, which is supposed to be an economist. Uh, and he was named as one of the most influential Ukrainian economists, according to Forbes magazine. So uh, I would like to welcome all of our panelists. Um, I uh, see that we have some, um, uh, some people watching us already. So if you're interested, um, uh, if something is not clear, if you want to answer, if you want to have some questions, uh, please feel free to use the YouTube chat. Uh, we'll try to collect these questions and answer them at the end. Uh, we also have two representatives of Polish press, uh, Ms. Anna Augustin, and unfortunately also uh, coming late, uh, Mr. Bartek Kotseko, um, uh, from Ms. Augustin is from uh, one of the most po famous Polish radio stock FM, and Bartek Kotseko is from Polish uh, web portal Oko Press. Um, now, uh, I should also mention that during the event, we will be discussing, uh, sorry, we will be collecting uh, charitable donations to Ukraine, and I want to give uh, now my uh, voice to you, Plustenhauer, uh, to explain this in detail. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas. Yes, dear colleagues, dear guests, also a very warm welcome from my side. So, I am assistant professor at Heidelberg University and also a representative of the Ukrainian-German NGO, Freundschaft kennt keine Grenze, from uh, which we are organizing this event in cooperation with uh, three universities. And about our NGO, in addition to medical aid and tourniquets and evacuation buses, which we are, like many volunteers, now sending to Ukraine, the main focus of our NGO is actually education in Ukraine. 
And uh, a few weeks ago, we again visited Ukraine on a trip with humanitarian aid, myself included. And here we also had the opportunity to visit schools and boarding schools and to talk with people who are taking care there of uh, internally displaced refugees and pupils affected by the war. And here we noticed that there are many needs that, can, that Ukraine cannot meet on its own right now. And one very important aspect where help is needed is facilitating distance learning for pupils who cannot go to school physically due to the war currently. And here we want to make a difference. Therefore, during this event, we sincerely ask you to join us in supporting Ukraine school education by making a donation to the account of our NGO and also spreading the word to others. So how can you donate? At the top of this stream on the video, you see a QR code that brings you directly to PayPal. And also there's the PayPal link and our bank account details in the description of the video. Thank you so much and have a very interesting discussion. And I now give over uh, to our moderator, Alexandra Avdeenko from Heidelberg University as well. Thank you so much, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here to moderate this great discussion today. Um, the war has torn apart people, but it has also brought together people. For me, it's an honor to be also part of the representatives of the uh, NGO, and I hope we will collect some donations. But let me first um, now start with uh, introducing you to what to expect over the coming hour and a half. Um, we will be listening, first of all, to Jeffrey Sonnenfeld, who will give us an, uh, in, an introduction into his famous work, Business Retreats and Sanctions, uh, how they're crippling the Russian economy. Um, please, Stephen, uh, put up the slides, if you don't mind. And then afterwards, we will go over to um, Professor Benjamin Mall and uh, Lucas, Rachel, as well as Timofey Milovanov, who will give their view in about five to seven minutes um, on the topic and different aspects of it. So with this, not to lose any precious time, I suggest Jeffrey, please go ahead and start with uh, sh uh, sharing your view on this topic. Uh, thanks very much, Alexandra. And Tomas, thank you for your nice introduction and, and framing up front. Uh, I'm I'm honored to, to be uh, to join with with Christian Benjamin Lukash and your various areas of, of expertise. So uh, I actually eagerly look forward to the the panel presentation from a uh, an on the ground Ukraine uh, perspective of from of course Christian and, and Benjamin your your uh, your expertise on natural gas and, and other areas has a somewhat daunting and not to mention uh, you know you know Lukash your sense of, uh, of of expertise just on on Russia energy in general. Uh, you guys have some good track record on these areas, so please just consider me um, the, your warm-up act uh, rather than panelist to my presentation. I, I'm there as the door opener, if you will, to your authentic expertise. Uh, but I will say that <clears throat> uh, I've been uh, working on this front uh, in a very, very broad way for a long time, from Christian's overly, uh, well, actually, Tomas's overly generous uh, introduction, uh, the uh, uh, area that I've been working on, uh, as he mentioned, some of the books and areas has been on corporate social impact. Uh, and I've been working on that. I, I shouldn't admit this for 45 years. You know, it, uh, this is, uh, in fact, the, the first book, Corporate Views of the Public Interest back in 1980. I think I still look like that, which is really pathetic. Uh, but been looking at, at various areas where, where companies uh, can in fact do uh, good as well as doing well, that they are not antithetical to each other uh, and, and um, created the world's first school for, for uh, incumbent CEOs. And that's how I got a good uh, link into before by the World Economic Forum, Forbes, Fortune, Business Week, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, or others that got into that space. And we continue doing that, which is how I, I thought I had a pretty good lock on CEO engagements. And yet I was caught by surprise on February 24th uh, uh, with the outbreak of war uh, when uh, almost instantly a number of multinationals that would I would never have featured in prior work were the early movers to pull out of Russia. Uh, not that there's anything necessarily wrong with those companies, but they're companies that often have been in, midst in the midst of controversy or have uh, uh, tried desperately to avoid geopolitical conflicts. It, it, big tech, big oil, 
and uh, professional service firms were the first movers. It's usually consumer goods companies that either through the personal sentiments of those CEOs or the um, uh, uh, well, if it, it may be something to do with uh, a geopolitical harmony that they knew perhaps more about or just that they, out of self-interest, uh, feel they have a lock on public uh, sentiment uh, more closely than some industrial goods companies. Uh, but they were late. Consumer goods companies, food, fashion, and and others uh, advertising were were a bit late to uh, this initiative. Uh, oil companies, of course, with their oligarchical entanglements, they had a perhaps you might say an enlightened self interest for trying to disentangle themselves early. Uh, and but with forever the motives, it was uh, uh, impressive uh, that companies like BP would write down nine billion dollars and. Uh, 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 Exxon about uh, six or seven and uh, and four or five for for Shell. Uh, then seeing uh, the the big tech companies uh, where they of course uh, haven't had the same climate change uh, issues uh, or oligarchical issues directly as the uh, the big oil, but they certainly had uh, privacy uh, attacks on them and questions about the uh, promotion of, of of hate speech and. Uh, 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 antitrust concerns that they got in front on this was it was quite noteworthy. And the professional service firms, the lawyers, the accountants, uh, consultants that usually would rather jump off a cliff than get involved in conflicts of um, political nature between clients, that they moved so early was noteworthy. So I, I talked to most of the CEOs of those 12 as I, <clears throat> because of this prior work, I knew them. Uh, and they, what they were most concerned about were um, uh, not that they were taking risks by being out in front, which is what I expected. Uh, we heard that from the second wave. Uh, CEOs are often concerned about what others are doing. Their boards want benchmarking, what uh, normal people might call, uh, you know, a peer affirmation uh, support. Uh, and they weren't concerned about that, though. Again, that was the second wave that cared about that. They were concerned about a lot of fraudsters, a lot of companies that were getting credit because of clever public relations spin, uh, media smoke screens that were getting equal credit for doing nothing, uh, giving a dollar fifty to uh, uh, Ukraine, or, or so they would say, something token, and uh, and saying that their hearts and minds were with the Ukrainian people not using the word war, not criticizing Russia and not pulling out of Russia. And the media was giving them, conflating them with the bold companies that actually took some risks and wrote down assets. So uh, Stephen uh, Tian, who's on the call with me, our research director, we immediately went to work and ultimately enlisted a team of 42 people uh, around the world uh, uh, with uh, native fluency, since many of them were living in in, in Poland and and uh, and uh, you know we have quite a team in in Warsaw and Moscow, uh, in and in, in Uzbekistan we have people in Tashkent and elsewhere. They could give us some reading of what's happening on the ground as well as from all kinds of places. Uh, many at Yale, but many at Columbia, Wharton, Johns Hopkins, Harvard, and elsewhere that had just great expertise on on uh, corporate governance, on industry analysis, on energy issues, on macroeconomic concerns. Uh, so that we could then properly categorize what these companies were doing authoritatively. At one point, we had 22 legal threats coming at us at once that were pretty ferocious, uh, but we conceded none of them and won all and properly classified companies ultimately in a list of, of that grew from the original 12 as we went public with who was real and who wasn't. Uh, the, grew, the list grew enormously. Uh, there's an old uh, saying, an old adage in uh, a U.S. Supreme Court justice uh, 70 years ago, Justice Louis Brandeis said uh, that uh, sunlight is the best antiseptic. And there was a cleansing effect to putting a spotlight on the hundreds of companies that were making issuing platitudes, but not really doing anything, just cliches. Uh, and there was that, that launched a stampede. As we went public with who they were, the stocks crashed. Uh, around March 4th, uh, I went on uh, the television and Fortune magazine, CNBC, elsewhere, uh, and we put those companies out there. And you could see their stocks fell anywhere from, from 12, 15 percent to, to 33, 34 percent on a day of the markets, unlike today, on the day that the markets were only down uh, four and five percent on major indices. So uh, we saw that, uh, oh, do you have that there, Stephen? 
uh, yeah, these are these are the companies. Now, a lot of them changed, so I wouldn't be condemning these companies, uh, but they changed dramatically as they got uh, spotlighted, as they were showcased. So we saw that that list, thanks, to, grew from, from the original 12 to 50 to 75 to 500, and now we're tracking 1,300. Never in our lifetimes, never in your parents' lifetimes, never in our grandparents' lifetimes, never in recorded economic history have we seen such a massive exit. This is an economic blockade like nothing we've seen before. I worked closely with several of the CEOs because one advantage of being older than the rest on this panel is I got to know the CEOs fairly well of Coke, Coca-Cola, uh, especially um, it was really the president, non-CEO of Coke, who who helped lead the initiative to pull out of South Africa. <clears throat> the <clears throat> the often uh, controversial um, imperfect CEO of General Motors who had them pull out of South Africa and, and the CEO of IBM that I, I knew very well that that led a, a, what was considered the largest such move of multinationals in history in the late 1980s. It was 200 companies. He were, you know, looking at six times that. It's incredible. And the economic force then of those 200 was significant. South Africa was more a central player uh, in uh, the network of economic dependencies than it is today. The mines in the Congo hadn't yet been as fully developed as they are today for certain rare earth minerals. Uh, uh, diamonds, uh, 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 gold and silver, we we're way more, for industrial drilling uh, of diamonds and things, way more dependent on South Africa at the time. Uh, the Zimbabwe or Rhodesia at the time was uh, caught up in various types of conflict. There, there was, there were issues that, that um, there was a lot of, of immediate self-interest for the business community to not do what they did. And this was over the preferences of then President Ronald Reagan in the U.S., who was against um, economic sanctions. And in fact, uh, the Republican Party on the government side, led by the uh, current Republican leader of the Senate, Mitch McConnell, overrode his own partisan president, uh, Ronald Reagan, saying that he had it wrong on this one. It was a, a massive 77 to 22 vote. But what was very important that uh, I learned uh, coming out of that era, I never got to know Mand uh, uh, Mandela, unfortunately, but I, I did get to know uh, Bishop Tutu, Desmond Tutu, who was a major anti-apartheid activist. And he told me, which is, I think, a really important point to scream from the mountaintops here, that Stephen and I have been trying to explain to government leaders around the world, is that government sanctions alone often don't succeed in an economic blockade. They can be, but people love to recycle the disappointments of uh, from the Western perspective of Cuba, North Korea, Iran, and things, there is there is no private sector, very little private sector, and no voluntary private sector support for those initiatives. Uh, the the things we saw with Yaroslavsky in Poland, or uh, that some of you know so well, or you know we could talk about Ukraine in an earlier era, but uh, maybe uh, Ceausescu in in Romania, or Eric Honecker in East Germany or Pinochet in Chile, or in Argentina soon after, or uh, Libya, which was different than the than the shifts that were explained by a more of a religious fervor in the uh, Ara Arab Spring, is uh, the Gaddafi was an economic blockade that ultimately Arm and Hammer uh, finally uh, passed away, and they, they could get, who had been the CEO of Occidental Petroleum, could get them on board. So in fact, we saw that tyrants could be taken down uh, through economic force and all those other cases. So when these businesses pulled out in this case in Russia, Ukraine, it, it's extraordinary. Now, it isn't that they necessarily had the geopolitical goals of, of stalling out Putin or toppling Putin or or, or intervening in the sovereign uh, leadership of another nation of Russia. They just didn't want to be a part of it. And what we ultimately found now in studying these 1,200 companies, and you can go to um, take a look at this research for free on at SSRN, the Social Science Research Network site. We we have a, a, a very successful, immodestly, a very successful paper there. Uh, it's also been profiled in a lot of places, Washington Post and elsewhere, that actually shows uh, the, the magnitude of companies leaving as we graded them on an A to F scale, A for a complete withdrawal, B for a, a full uh, exit, but it's listed as temporary suspension. C is a partial withdrawal. They have major lines of business there. D, for legal reasons, we had to acknowledge them. I think it's largely deceptive, uh, an illusion. Companies said they're going to forego some 
some non-specified uh, future long-term investments, which in many cases they've never even admit, uh, had suggested before. And, and F, the companies that were digging in uh, 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 determined, not didn't care at all, is that proportionate to that exit, the more dramatically a company pulled out, the more they were immediately uh, received favorably uh, in financial circles. And yeah, thank you, Stephen. So you can see that it it, it isn't modest and it doesn't take uh, complex conjoint analysis, multidimensional scaling or any kinds of statistical gymnastics for proper uh, inference. No stepwise regressions, nothing. It, this is, you can, it's this actual, actual absolute time series data. And, and you can see it from the day and the minute they make an announcement when, when society, society uh, general or Carlsberg beer announces, they pull out within minutes, you see a, a major pop in their stock positively and nothing else happened in those companies in that time. It, they didn't repaint the walls. They didn't change the leadership. They didn't announce a new product. Uh, the only thing that happened was the announcement that they were withdrawing from Russia so that doing good was, again, consistent with doing well, despite some of the battles we see about ESG in the U.S. or other politicized issues, is at least in this case, it's indisputable that the companies who, who did the right thing and moved out did well for their shareholders as well as uh, uh, hopefully in the cause of um, of geopolitical uh, 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 you know, harmony, or at least uh, uh, pr protecting Ukraine on this front, they didn't want to be involved. So what the financial markets rewarded them for was the reduction of operational risk. Uh, there are a lot of supply and other uncertainties due to the sanctions. The financial risk, uh, uh, which you could enumerate on what they experienced there, but the reputation risk for the companies, uh, for the sense of goodwill of that enterprise, the mission of the company, the brand value of the company, or even most um, uh, perhaps of greatest self-interest, the, the reputation of the executives involved as they are not enhanced by staying there. Well, then we thought, well, we're done with this. No, not really. Even through the night, Stephen and I, especially Stephen and his team were up through the night working on upgrading, um, in very few cases, downgrading. Uh, the companies have largely, uh, there's been a mass exodus, a stampede to those uh, A and B categories. The C category is not large. And the D, in our mind, we, we, we equate them with the Fs, but, but legally uh, we had to separate them because uh, uh, they acknowledged at least there is a war or something going on. But, uh, but, we, but there's a massive move so that we see that there are the hundreds and hundreds of companies that have uh, really uh, completely pulled out. And, and that they were rewarded for it, but we weren't done, even though we have to continually upgrade through the through 24 seven, working on the cap proper calibration of these companies is, uh, and, and supporting that it was good for them financially, uh, as well as uh, we, is that Putin was suggesting, of course, it wasn't real. So we had to, we had to authenticate that these companies actually did pull out. So then uh, the, the President Putin's next range of propaganda was to suggest that it was inconsequential. And he was readily joined and still is joined by people on the left and the right, say the New York Times, we were just with him at a KSE event. And I like him very much personally. I've known him since our doctoral years, Paul Krugman, uh, on the somewhat left-leaning, saying these blockades never work because he forgot about those examples that I just reminded you guys of, where it does work. And, um, you know, Michelle Le Pen on the right, uh, suggesting, of course, in France, that these things never work. Uh, and she was wrong as well. As uh, but, but they were unwitting as not too much Eastern European press, a little bit of Central European press, but mainly snarky, um, uh, for a lot of good reasons and some bad reasons, skeptical British press that is just skeptical of uh, managerial mindsets, and were uh, uh, and some very young um, U.S. journalists that, because of the short-term um, attention focus of U.S. media, we're we're consumed by other issues issues right now. So the A team, the more senior journalists, are not focused on Ukraine, Russia anymore. And the youngsters that are doing these compilations are picking up a lot of British press. Uh, and by the way, not all the British press. The the everything from the Express on one hand to um, uh, to the Daily Express to the uh, Daily Telegram has been fantastic on this. But others, the the Guardian, and some have been very disappointing to actually be repeating verbatim Putin's propaganda using one of you know, Putin's only handpicked sources. Uh, uh, and and it's uh, ast astounding is in, in your opening, Alexandra, 
is uh, you, that GDP number and the ruple. Uh, those are fictional numbers to see any in the West. And again, because they have more experience on this, uh, the uh, hardly any do we see in the Polish press, do we see in Central or, or Eastern European press falling for this. This only happens in some, some Western European press and in a ridiculous amount, um, you know, like an arcade game where we're going after smacking this stuff down in the U.S. media as they, they are unwittingly repeating verbatim Putin propaganda. The same journalists that know that the 82 uh, Russian journalists that lost their balance and fell out of windows didn't actually fall out of windows, or the aviation um, uh, CEO, a Russian aviation uh, CEO who spoke out against the war that lost his balance two days ago and fell to his death in Russia, or, or, or that, you know, um, that the first Jewish president of Ukraine is not a Nazi, that they know that this stuff is, is empty Putin nonsense. We're falling for the GDP number and the ruple. Just to scream it from the mountaintop, the ruple is not an exchange traded currency. Uh, it's by fiat. He basically wakes up in the morning and assigns a number. Uh, and uh, as you can see, this, there's, there's no rebound in the ruble. Uh, and even worse than this, the GDP uh, is what Stephen could put up. There's, there's the GDP number <clears throat> is a complete fiction uh, that the, um, to be a member of the IMF, and, and now finally the IMF has cut off as of you know, yesterday any, uh, any opportunity for Russia to borrow, uh, is the, the IMF unwittingly didn't realize that they uh, what's required of anybody to be a part of the IMF to, to contribute 60 key statistics is they have um, uh, suppressed the information that for 30 years and for 20 years, the data was reasonably good. But for 30 years post perestroika, the uh, the EU, uh, the uh, the um, the uh, uh, Russia has been putting out the, the truth to the IMF to some extent uh, on these key uh, variables. They suppressed all this. And, and uh, Western journalists, uh, many of them missed it. Macroeconomists in, in my own field uh, uh, missed this. Uh, the IMF, all senior leadership, missed this. And um, they, they, uh, we don't know uh, from Russia, that is, what their exports are on anything, what their imports are on anything. They'll make up different numbers and things. They're not reporting it on the monthly basis as they always did. The 20 key uh, um, industrial sectors they used to report on, they did get Q1's data out where we saw it fell anywhere from 20 to 65% in the first quarter. And then Putin, of course, suppressed that and concealed that information. The reporting of the, of the, uh, 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 the performance of major financial institutions in Russia, which had always been required and always reported on monthly, has disappeared. Uh, the uh, information on foreign direct investment has disappeared. All this kind of stuff uh, that you need to support the GDP invented number, they don't have. So now, uh, candidly, uh, in meetings, several rounds of meetings, uh, just between we close friends around the world watching this, we can't show you the numbers, although we do have their slide deck. And Stephen, we probably should not you maybe you want to flash it. We really shouldn't because we said we is the the IMF has admitted they got it wrong. Rather than it being down four or five percent, as Putin says, they admit it's actually the GDP has fallen fifty percent, five zero percent. But they don't want to lose face because first they told us, well, we don't really focus on Russia because we just included them parenthetically in our global forecasts. Well, those global forecasts, they don't, they're understanding the, the, the authority that the IMF has to journalists, to industry analysts and others. And that was nonsense. So they fell for that and put it out there uh, with what is, what is knowingly false information as we speak. They're going to revise it, but uh, you will see in three weeks, they're going to put out a revised forecast, but they are knowingly going to put it out as a 15% decline around that. Uh, unless they hear this broadcast and drop that completely. And then in January, they're going to get to the full 50%. So they don't look foolish. They're going to do it in waves. But they know right now it, what information, what guidance they've given is wrong. Similarly, industry analysts that have been uh, guiding policymakers have been wrong. JP Morgan's energy team told the world in April and May that by now energy prices would be $380 uh, a, a barrel for oil, let's say. We're nowhere close to that, even though we, we see that because of uh, central bank policies, we have a crashing economy today, crashing markets rather, and we see people are, are we think, wrongly blaming energy for this. 
In fact, uh, as, as the experts on this panel know better than we do, the energy forwards markets uh, looking forward in the future are actually pretty encouraging. Uh, and uh, the, the, the notion that, um, that Putin is some global energy czar with this smirking savvy is just wrong, that he could tell the world. And again, economists, industry experts, industry experts, and uh, the IMF and others believe that he could just pivot natural gas which Russia largely, not completely, but almost completely produces uh, as vapor that has to go through pipelines, which almost don't exist going to Asia. He can't pivot take to Asia. He has one creaky little uh, pipeline, uh, nothing like what goes into Europe, but 87% of Russia's gas was going to the EU. What do you think it is now? It's, well, it, it, and by the way, the EU had depended on 43, 44% uh, of their gas from Russia. Now it's below, it's below 10% from Russia. And uh, there are still, despite the shutdowns of, 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 of uh, the, the new pipelines, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the two older ones that go through Turkey uh, and, uh, uh, and, and Ukraine are still bringing in uh, uh, a fair bit is uh, already uh, the uh, the EU has about 85 percent, almost 85 percent of storage capacity uh, filled for the winter, which is 15 or 20 percent above where they were this time last year. Uh, and the oil is still flowing, ev even though Nord Stream 1, if we say that's shut down, Nord Stream 2 won't come up uh, for a long time, uh, if ever. Uh, that uh, that the existing pipelines are sending enough in it, but if we uh, if we were to shut that if Russia were to shut that spigot off as we we're speaking, uh, the EU can do fine because of not only what's stored, but because the U.S. now brings more gas into the EU than Russia did at its peak, and Norway has uh, uh, is, is handily supplementing that with this six mega uh, conversion plants that. Uh, uh, from uh, LNG, liquefied natural gas, back to uh, vapor form that can be delivered throughout Europe. That'll be done by the end of December. So getting from here to December uh, is, a, is, a, is a modest challenge, not a major challenge, a modest challenge if all gas were cut off. Uh, there's other sourcing capability, but we can see that uh, Europe doesn't need any Russian gas, and Gazprom has already cut back more, had already cut back more than 30% of its production. Nobody else is able to buy it, and they can't pivot and sell it uh, to China or, uh, or to uh, India. Oil, they could, but there's um, uh, the deep discounts they've had to, to, uh, to deliver to. Uh, to sell that oil to uh, India and China is not a, a, a fueling Russia's war machine. If it's $35 a barrel, a discount, uh, that was pretty profound. As you saw perhaps two days ago, there just was an 18% increase in that discount. So Russia uh, has now had to succumb to even greater arm twists from India and China. The bad news for India is they were so happy to get this, this incredibly cheap oil that they've their capacity is about filled, so their oil capacity in India uh, is is has reached uh, uh, um, higher limits than even the EU's gas storage. Is they don't know what to do with all the oil they have from Russia. Their tanks are filled. They say tanks a lot. They I don't. They can't put it in their garages or their underwear and sock drawers or in their kitchens or in their bathrooms. They don't know what to do with all the oil. They can't now. China can still use it, but they're getting it at a very deep discount. Uh, this is uh, and Indonesia has now secured pretty much the same contracts. Well, on oil, well, um, but it's not great for Russia, is what the press keeps getting wrong, saying, well, these higher revenues, they're not higher revenues. They're, it's, um, they are the least efficient producer. Sure, they're the third largest OPEC producer. They're the least efficient producer. Even though there's been a massive exodus under Medora uh, of um, of, of expertise in Venezuela for oil extraction, even Venezuela, which with antiquated technology towers over Russia in efficiency, but the Saudis can extract oil for $22 a barrel from the ground. Russia, it's $46 a barrel. So if you take the $85 a barrel price and take off the $35 discount, they're selling at about $40 to $50 a barrel for maybe a $4 
profit margin. No, it's not a $4 profit margin. It's not figuring in the cost of capital, which is significant, but put that aside because Russia can't invest much anyway. They don't have the expertise in technology. Uh, so what is still Russia making a few dollars? Well, it's lost in time and transit and expenses and shipping. Is it cost them more than a month uh, added to get that oil uh, to uh, to China? It's a uh, 34 days as opposed to two or three days or at most four days to, to get that oil shipped uh, from Russia to to the EU. So th no, it's the, the status quo is is actually pretty darn good. Except it's good, Je Jeffrey. That's really good to hear. Like uh, <laughs> your perspective that everything is fine. I think it's um, a perfect introduction into um, the perspective, maybe of the worries that we have here so often in Europe. I have. I would like to maybe make it um, uh, share the perspective or hand over Please. to Benjamin because um, he has been one of the big fighters against all the misinformation that we have seen, like nonstop tweeting against so many uh, wrong perceptions, and he. He will share and add his view, if you don't mind, on um, the relative costs that we perceive here. Um, you painted a picture which is very nice for Russia. Uh, for, well, not which is seems that um, the um, sanctions are working. Now, Benjamin, if you don't mind sharing your views on what what do you think does it mean for Europe and what are maybe the relative merits of import import versus export sanctions that could be um, changed or um, added. Thank you so much. Great. Um, thanks, uh, Jeff. That was uh, fascinating, and I'm glad I, I got to see you talk about it live. And thanks about uh, you know organizing this event um, and uh, also this NGO. You have uh, Freundschaft kennt keine Grenzen. Seems like a really great thing. So I want to just encourage the people listening online to donate as well. Um, so yeah, I wanted to make. Um, Three points, uh, two of which Alex has already said. So the first one is sort of um, effectiveness of different types of sanctions. So sanctions on Russian imports versus uh, sanctions on Russian exports. So Russian imports, I guess, being um, you know uh, uh, the companies operating there that, that Jeff has been talking about, and uh, like things like microchip imports um, and exports being energy uh, in particular. And then I wanted to talk about um, the relative effects of sanctions on uh, Russia versus the EU. Um, so what we sort of know about that. And then the final thing was going to be sort of a bit more of a meta point about um, data and what we know and what we don't know and so on. Um, <clears throat> okay, so so turning to the to the first point, um, I should also say, so let me preface this a bit as well. Um, I've not really thought hard or carefully looked at data um, uh, for a bunch of the points I was going to make. And so I'm not really an expert on the Russian economy. Instead, I'm going to rely very heavily on some, um, you know, very smart uh, uh, people I know and, and I respect very much and who, who I've learned a lot from. So in particular, sort of Oleg Itzkaki and my LSE colleague, Dmitry Mukin and Sergei Guriev um, and Elina Rybakova, these, these kind of people. Um, but um, you know, so so I'll, I'll kind of parrot a bit what what they've been telling me. Um, but then on the EU and German economy, I've I've, I've thought a lot about that. So that, that that's going to be more my own views. Okay, so um, the effectiveness of different types of sanctions. Okay, so sanctions on on Russian imports versus sanctions on exports. So again, like think uh, Russian imports would be microchips, airplane parts, um, these kind of things, or these these. Uh, you know, Fortune 500 companies operating within Russia, and then Russian exports would be oil, gas, and coal in particular, okay? And there, there's sort of a misconception I want to take off the table and that you sometimes hear, um, which is you don't really need the export sanctions. So we can get by without um, sort of sanctioning oil, gas, and coal, and it's sufficient to, um, you know, have the, the import sanctions. Um, and the, the logic uh, that proponents of that argument will make is sort of, you can't eat the euros, right? Um, and instead, you 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 know the Russians can only eat the goods that you can buy with the euros that you get from the energy uh, exports. Um, but then, if we just restrict the you know selling the, these goods to Russia, then that's going to do the trick. Um, and you know that would obviously be nice because um, I do think it's correct that export sanctions are probably more costly 
for the European um, economy than um, uh, the import sanctions are. Um, um, but I'm gonna, and so so then maybe that would be you know nice if we could just do everything with import sanctions and be low cost for for Europe. Um, but I'm gonna say it's kind of wrong, okay? And the I think the easiest way to think about why this is wrong, and this is a sort of a thought experiment I have from uh, Hanno Lustig at Stanford, um, which I quite like, is okay if you think that export sanctions, so sanctions on. Uh, you know, oil, gas, and coal revenues for Russia don't do anything. That's the same as if you think, um, let's drop a parachute with like a billion euros in the Red Square in Moscow. Um, uh, and what do you think will happen? And if you think that the export sanctions, you know, don't help at all or don't do anything, that's the same as thinking no one would want to, you know, get those euros that you dropped in the Red Square. People would just kind of burn them and like be not interested in them. Okay. Um, so, you know, that obviously sounds wrong, right? And we kind of think that obviously people would rush to get these, these all these euros and they, they would have some use to it. And there's sort of two reasons why this is wrong. Okay, the first one is, um, it's not true that imports to Russia are zero, okay? Um, they, they've dropped a lot. Um, so imports from Russia um, coming from, uh, by Russia, sorry, coming from the EU. They've dropped a lot, but they're very far from zero, okay? That's, that's the first thing. Um, so they, they can still you know, buy uh, 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 goods with those euros. Um, and the second thing that's often forgotten about is um, the euros um, that Russia gets uh, from, from energy sales are really important for the Russian government budget. Okay, so um, a lot of the Russian government budget um, uh, is funded uh, uh, by taxes um, on uh, uh, you know these 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 big state energy companies like Gazprom um, and 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 Rosneft. And then the key idea is um, if you if you can hurt those um, uh, uh, imports or these these export revenues, you're going to hurt the Russian government budget. There's sometimes an argument that people make: oh, um, you know Putin can just print rubles, um, but you know that's not true either because that's going to create other problems like uh, inflation and so on. Okay, um, and and then the key thing is, you know, once you take government revenue away from it, um, that ultimately, at least in the medium to long run, must mean there's less money uh, to fund the war, right? So war is expensive, um, and uh, you know you got to pay the soldiers somehow, and you got to pay the the building the tank somehow, and uh, that is exactly what the Russian uh, energy revenues are used for. In fact, there's like very direct examples of this. Um, so there's cases, right, of Gazprom Bank directly paying uh, 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 soldiers and, and mercenaries, um, and uh, you know they literally get um, their their salary check um, straight wired from Gazprom Bank, and that's you know comes straight out, out of the energy sales. So yeah, so I just want to take that misconception off the table um, uh, that you don't need those those expert sanctions. And in fact, sort of there's some nice papers again, especially by my LSE colleague Dimitri Mukin and and Oleg Gitskaki that show that these energy sanctions are sort of uh, uh, complements with the import sanctions. So both kind of work and and have important effects. Um, uh, and if anything, you know, we want to further tighten the the, the export sanctions. The second um, bigger point I wanted to get to is sort of the relative importance of the. Uh, uh, or the relative effects of the sanctions um, on the Russian versus EU economy. And there, the, the, the thing that you sometimes hear and that I want to take off the table is, so you sometimes hear these statements in particular, say in Germany, where I'm from, we don't want to do sanctions that hurt um, uh, us more than Russia. Okay, And especially back in, in April, there was often this, uh, this, this argument, we don't want to do a gas embargo, uh, for example, because you know, that would hurt the German economy more than the Russian economy. Um, and so the, the Confederation of German Industry, the BDE, for example, would go out and make these kind of statements. And I want to say, like, given everything we know just from, from the data, you know, how, how much of the imports uh, from Germany are, are from Russia and sort of how much of the export, Jeff talked about this, um, um, of Russia or to the EU, um, you... It just doesn't. It, it just doesn't make sense. Um, and instead, um, you you know you you basically have to think that. So okay, here's the, so you have to think that basically whatever sanctions we put in place um, are going to hit Russia much more than they hit us. 
Okay, that's the point I want to make. There is something that's true, which is the sanctions that will tend to hit Russia more and are more painful for Russia also tend to often be more painful for us. For example, a good one, uh, a good example of this is um, gas versus oil sanctions, right? So oil sanctions um, are not so painful for us um, because we can get the oil from some from somewhere else. But um, the flip side of that is that also for Russia, they're probably not that painful because they can um, sell the oil to somewhere else because you can put oil on a, on a ship. On the other hand, um, gas, um, sanctions or uh, you know gas uh, you know export restrictions those are um, uh, quite painful for Russia because exactly as as Jeff said you know gas is bound to these pipelines and you cannot just Russia cannot just turn around um, and sell them somewhere else but on the other hand that's also exactly what makes it hard for us the fact that the gas is bound to pipeline so that's that's all true but at the same time for any sanction you get there you should always think that. From what we know about the data, um, that uh, Russia will be hit harder um, by, I would say, like a factor of three or five or something like this, or maybe even ten, um, um, uh, than than uh, than say a country like Germany. And the final thing, just very briefly, and I'll wrap up, is um, I do want to say um, I think it's really important to be a bit humble in the assessment um, of how effective these sanctions are, or what we think. Uh, uh, you know, and I think the fundamental problem there is exactly what Jeff said is there's just a lot of missing data. A lot of these numbers that are being put out are kind of fictitious um, numbers that are made up. Um, um, and so we just don't have the data to really assess what the say GDP drop is or will be in, in, in Russia, I think, and, and unemployment and so on. Um, and I, I'm probably, Optimistic as well, like like Jeff is, that the sanctions are um, um, working. But I do think we 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 want to be a bit careful. And the the risk with saying things, I think, like okay, GDP in Russia will drop like fifty percent or, or by by a really huge amount, is that you know when the numbers are then going to come out, and it's not like that. Um, that the risk is that you know, we, we create false expectations. And, and then people are going to say, oh, yeah, the sanctions aren't working, uh, which, which would be wrong. So we got to be careful to create realistic expectations. Okay, I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you so much, Benjamin. So I think uh, while Lukas uh, is he's going to be our next speaker, he's putting up his slides. I'm gonna, he, he's going to speak about the objectives of the sanctions and whether the, we are actually meeting them, which is quite nice. In the meantime, while you were fast, I wanted to again remind our audience to please donate to the good cause for the children of Ukraine. You see the QR code that's going to lead you to a PayPal account, and we hope to um, collect a bit of donations. Thank you so much, um, Lukas. Please, the floor is yours for five to seven, min seven minutes. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Alexandra. It's a great pleasure to be uh, on this distinguished panel. and. Uh, Thank you to the organizers for putting the fundraiser together. Um, yeah, so I thought I'm going to start my presentation by, uh, by basically reviewing the objective of sanctions or the way I, the way I think about them. Um, so I think there's one primary goal and then two longer term secondary goals. The primary goal, of course, is to bring forward the end of Russia's invasion uh, of Ukraine. And I think we can think about two dimensions in which sanctions can help achieve this goal. They can uh, the sanctions can make the war more costly for uh, Putin's regime. Uh, in economic terms, we can try to alter the choices of the regime for a given set of constraints. And secondly, and perhaps more importantly, sanctions can reduce Russia's capacity to finance and conduct the war. So can, sanctions can actually tighten the constraints. And as, as I said, this primary goal is sort of near time in nature. Every day, uh, every day matters here. Uh, but I think there's two secondary goals that are sort of more longer term. Uh, one is to, that we want to prevent future wars by Russia, uh, a non-democratic, uh, it turns out to be an aggressive regime. And second, we want to achieve independence of, of democratic countries from Russia. Uh, and I, I think the, the big picture I want to highlight here is that I think the sanctions that we have implemented, they, they're very likely going to inflict very significant damage on Russia in the long term. Uh, and in the short term, the picture is more, more nuanced and a bit more mixed. So uh, um, 
let, let me take you through that. But in order to achieve these object, uh, objectives, uh, the sanctions should be exploiting Russia's vulner Russia uh, vulnerability. And it's basically about, I think, six main vulnerabilities of Russian economy. So first is the dependence of uh, this economy on the energy revenues. Second is the reliance on uh, foreign currency reserves. It's reliance on Western financial system and on Western technology. Fifth is the uh, fifth vulnerability is the access of Russians to Western goods and amenities that uh, that Russians enjoy. And the final one is the reliance of the regime on loyal oligarchs, propagandists, politicians, and civil servants. Okay, and I think the Western sanctions regime is smart in a sense that it does um, target these uh, specific vulnerabilities, but it does so better in some places uh, than others. So let me first start with what is uh, what I think is working particularly well. So I think, first of all, it has been mentioned uh, by both uh, Jeff and Ben, restrictions on Russian imports uh, do seem to be working. At least there seem to be specific pockets of the Russian economy where the impact is pretty severe, both in terms of civilian industries and, and military. Um, second, I think the outflow of technology and know-how will surely be detrimental to, to Russian economic growth in, in the longer term. And third, the long-term independence of the West from Russian energy is pretty much a given now. I cannot imagine you know, further reliance on, on Russian energy to persist into the long term. And I think that's really going to, going to hurt Russia. Um, so let me illustrate the one impact. Well, let me just share with a couple of pictures the, the short-term impact of, uh, of this import restrictions. So this figure shows uh, it shows you that some industries like the passenger car production or aviation have experienced a dramatic drops in activity, uh, up to 90 to 95% reduction in activity in these sectors. And famously, Russian cars, the ones that are still being produced, are not produced with uh, are not being produced without uh, airbags, for example. So clearly, these global value chains for uh, you know advanced manufacturing really plays a, plays a role here, and uh, and import sanctions can really bite in these sectors. More directly constraining Russia's ability to uh, wage the war, uh, there's just a lot of components uh, in Russia's military equipment that come from uh, from the West, basically. So the research has shown um, about 450 unique microelectronic components that uh, that come from abroad. And so restricting the ability of Russia to import these components really uh, can play an outsized role in the ability of Russia to replenish uh, their stocks of weapons and to, and to carry on with the, with the war. Missing piece, of course, has been energy. So, so far, or at least in the first six months of the, of the war, there has been no meaningful impact on Russia's ability to generate revenues uh, uh, from, from the sales of energy. Uh, indeed, we have left this, uh, you know, field of, of play kind of completely to Russia, so that Russia can uh, has managed to successfully weaponize energy sales, and that has led to higher energy prices in the meantime. And uh, as I'll show you, that has generated some substantial revenues in the first uh, six months of the war. And you can see here in the corner the, the matrix of matrix of exports. I mean, everybody knows this by now that Russia really is uh, very much reliant. On the export side, on the export of these basic of these basic materials, and then the the the, um, the combination of this strong energy exports and uh, and the import restrictions that were quite strong also results in this interesting dynamic on the ruble that Ben has already mentioned, and I think Jeff as well. So I just wanted to show you some research that uh, uh, done by uh, by the researchers that already mentioned by Ben and Mukin and Iskoki on the. Um, you know, forces driving the ruble exchange rate. Uh, this is important because in the uh, in the talk of um, sanctions fatigue, ruble is often you know cast as the uh, as the as the example of why sanctions are ineffective or not working. But indeed, this research shows that the ruble's trajectory only tells us about the kind of sanctions that have been implemented, and it does not tell us much about their effectiveness or the welfare of of, uh, of Russian regime. So in, essentially, this chart shows you the ruble exchange rate against the dollar. First, we see in the first month uh, in, of the invasion, we see a sharp depreciation as a result of uh, financial sanctions. But then strong policy response prevents the financial crisis in Russia. Uh, you know, many of us, I guess, hoped that there's going to be a more, uh, a more of a crisis event there, but it hasn't happened. Uh, and the financial sanctions impact has been uh, it has been declining over time because of this financial repression policies that have been implemented. 
Then the center stage belongs to the trade uh, component. So the import and the export, import sanctions and the strong export of, uh, of commodities drive uh, ruble appreciation uh, in, the, in the remaining uh, months of the war. But crucially, again, to stress that this research, this research shows that there's no simple mapping from the exchange rate dynamics to welfare. Um, and therefore, strong ruble does not mean that sanctions aren't working. It simply reflects the kind of sanctions that uh, have been imposed so far. In the first six months of the war, as I mentioned, the uh, sales of the energy have fueled large current account surpluses in Russia and uh, positive fiscal, uh, fiscal balances. Um, uh, but I think the situation here is changing very fast. So the numbers for August show a very rapid deterioration as the, weak, as the strength of the ruble bites in and as the uh, reduced exports of energy uh, you know, reduce, the, reduce the inflows. And I think with, uh, with the months to come, in months to come, we're going to see a sharp deterioration of the fiscal uh, balance. So that's something, that's something that uh, uh, we, should all, we should all watch. So what more can be done? Um, I think it's important to tighten and expand Russia's import restrictions and particularly focusing still on this technologically advanced products, uh, components and also services. There's probably some low hanging fruit in terms of this cost benefit analysis uh, that, that can still be done. Um, we should finalize and enforce the price cap on Russian oil, as the G7, uh, G7 is planning to do. And at home, we should continue efforts to transition our economies as fast as possible away from, from Russian energy, by pursuing new sources of supply, but also on the demand side, letting the price mechanism work uh, and letting uh, the higher prices lead to a reduction in demand. At the same time, supporting households and businesses to, to prevent the, the sanctions fatigue. Uh, so three bottom lines from, from my intro, um, you know, one is that sanctions that have been implemented, I think are working, but some of them uh, will take time before the, before the full effect is, uh, is visible. Second, sanctions that have only been discussed and not really implemented are not working yet, and I guess that's unsurprising. Um, uh, and third, it's time, I think, to take the initiative on the energy front. But we should uh, remember that Fortress Russia is still there, especially that over the first six months of the war, there has been this large inflow of cash into Russia. So we just need to be patient and realistic uh, and uh, with our expectations, as Ben said, uh, and try to avoid the sanctions fatigue as, as these sanctions bite off. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lucas. That was very interesting. And I actually would, uh, it's a good way to go over and maybe ask Jeffrey. Um, what do you think about the new sanctions that should be put up? There is a lot of discussions now, right, at the European Union. And what do you think would uh, be further sanctions that we would need? Um, uh, what should go into the new package? And when we speak about uh, what should, that sanctions work, we here refer obviously to um, economy, right? But then we see Putin still mobilizing and people going to the east. So um, when maybe you can be more, um, you can tell us more about work, what they work on and what they should be working on. Jeff, you're on mute. Uh, Jeff, you're still on mute. This is remuting me. I unmute, but uh, I keep getting remuted. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, good. Oh, there's Timothy. Timothy, I would you know always defer to you as your expertise. But we also have Christian uh, in terms of uh, a lot of the work that KSE has been doing on future sanctions needed. Uh, the 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 uh, uh, I think. The, the sanctions group uh, that McFaul, Yermak have been working on with KSE take us light years forward in terms of uh, a better job, more comprehensive job of targeting individual uh, oligarchs, but also government leaders uh, and more that could be done, uh, frankly, uh, to, to not enable their families to, uh, to invest abroad, to study abroad and, and, and things that, uh, that bring it to an individual level. There's uh, more that could be done institutionally. There's some better data sharing across uh, across countries, instituting separate sets of sanctions that hasn't always been well integrated. We're now seeing a couple of different packages that that you can more comprehensively see what different countries are doing. So uh, there's some cross referencing. Uh, but there hasn't been, as you know, uh, the um, elevated sanctions that are um, being proposed right now after. 
uh, Putin's latest, President Putin's latest um, saber rattling, of course, haven't been specified what they are, uh, but we look forward to seeing what else would unfold. But uh, there, there is more that could be done there. And again, I would defer to the, our KSE stars on the line for that. But I would, uh, I would add that what worries me is, uh, is that what Putin is up to on two fronts is uh, using today's crashing markets as we're speaking right now. I, I am, I am getting a, a, a an avalanche, to put it mildly. Uh, of alarmist messages coming in from CEOs, from media figures and others, trying to suggest that support from Ukraine somehow is tied in to uh, some perhaps central bank overreach or what, what should be a realization that monetary policy on the positive side has its limits on inflation issues. Uh, but uh, Putin is somehow trying to always use uh, a sense of anxiety, a crisis, to manufacture uh, and promote hysteria. So even more than whatever is, is being looked at in sanctions right now, it is um, the the UK's uh, um, approach to caps, uh, which is <clears throat> looking at uh, trying to, um, to help cover uh, the prospect of higher energy costs uh, and what that will mean for their economy as leading to some, some widespread uh, additional layers of, of panic in today's markets. Uh, and, and I think that that's one area that I'm worried about. Uh, and what's so timely about this panel, having this discussion, that everything we can do to get the truth out about energy and energy supply is critical. A somewhat longer term, not really very long term, but in a matter of, of days, uh, uh, but not months, a matter of days, when this panel and the the wisdom of this panel and many other sources start to get the truth out to markets about energy supply, uh, that we'll see a similar thing happening on the grain front. Uh, there's, uh, again, I would defer to the KSE people who don't want to brag because we we have not had a, a great last six weeks of weather in, in Europe and, and even worse so in China, but it's been devastating, of course, in in Africa, where we've had perhaps 70 year level record horrible uh, drought conditions and the prospect of famine and be that being blamed on Ukraine is also up the uh, sleeve of Putin, which has nothing to do with Ukraine. Uh, the the uh, uh, With these weather conditions, it may not be as great a bumper crop, but it may still be uh, the best uh, uh, returns, despite fields being shelled, despite harvesting being shelled, despite storage uh, facilities being bombed, despite rail lines being bombed and shipping being curtailed in the Black Sea, this still could be the greatest uh, record uh, uh, wheat harvest or grain harvest worldwide, including Ukraine uh, and Russia that we've seen in our lifetime. It is incongruous, so it, it should be that strong. Even in Ukraine now, we, we're always concerned about the heroism and the battlefield and the suffering of innocent civilians. We can't make, we can't forget the farmers have been still out there doing their job too. And it it could be, I don't know, it's usually 40 billion cubic metrics of grain produced on a, on a normal good year from Ukraine, but it could be quite a bit above that with Russia still coming in at 70. Uh, is a Ukraine still be, could be coming in halfway between that difference, which is remarkable. Uh, but I still worry about Putin trying to use economic distress on food and fuel right now, even more than on the sanctions. Mm -hmm. Again, let me stop and defer mm -hmm. to the experts on say, on new sanctions from KSE. Exactly. Thank you so much. We are uh, pleased to have Professor Milovanov with us now here, who, as Jeffrey rightly says, have are the experts who feel the consequences immediately. So, Timothy, maybe you can share your um, view on what is needed in terms of next sanctions and why, what your thoughts on price cap on energy supplies from Russia, and what is this talk about state terrorism that we see from Ukrainians and how to understand that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, do you think I can share the screen because I have the slides that I wanted to maybe mm -hmm. show? We can... let, let me try. Yeah. Well, so while he's is... bringing it up, I should mention it was it's sixty five million tons, not not cubic uh, meters. So sorry about that. I had the wrong uh, metric that I said, but uh, thanks and thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you. Now your co-hosts. Thank you. 
All right. So first of all, we have um, you will see my uh, my screen, and, and I'm I just I apologize for being so late. I, I'm flying uh, in different places uh, in uh, in the U.S. trying to advocate uh, for Ukraine as much as possible. Just arrived to Chicago to the University of Chicago, and we'll have a panel in about forty minutes from now. But or maybe in an hour. But uh, my plane was delayed, and that's why I, I physically could not could not get. I, I I was in the air. But thank you so much for your patience and support and accommodation. So here I, I this is uh, the Yermak uh, McFall's uh, group. I'm going to talk mostly about it. But the issues regular documents about the monitoring of the sanctions impact on Russia, about what needs to be done. Or for example, for the state uh, uh, sponsor uh, of terrorism designation, it addresses concerns and risks uh, that the United States might have and how they could be mitigated. We have a paper forthcoming, I think, shortly on state sponsor of terrorism. I'll talk about it. But we also do monitoring uh, of the, uh, and some of this data is coming from a lot of people who are helping us. Some of this is classified, so we're not doing any, uh, we're not releasing any classified data, but some of this goes into analysis. But basically the overall uh, Russia result of the sanctions uh, is expected sometime in the spring of the 2023. Um, that's going to be a breaking point of the economic growth, and we really need to undermine the revenues from uh, oil and gas. That's that's the objective, um, and uh, we need to stretch their budget. I'll talk about the objectives of the of the um, of the sanctions, how we should think about the sanctions. So here's basically a report in progress on what we do uh, and. Um, how in our view, uh, we, you know, we have to do it in the most efficient way so it doesn't affect the rest of the world as much, minimizes the cost and is effective. In order for this to be effective, we have to be very clear about what the objectives of the sanctions are. If, if we're just imposing sanctions for the sake of the sanctions, we might not necessarily be doing it in the most efficient way. So here's um, the group. The group uh, is uh, powered by people like, uh, uh, Jeff is here and Steven. So thank you so much for being a part of the group, but by many others too. And it was a upon request of President Volodymyr Zelensky early in the war, they uh, they created your Mark McFall group and the group is coordinated by two secretaries. Essentially, that's, that's a good governance example for how Ukraine can go forward uh, with a lot of issues. But there's this discussions about how do we do recovery? You know, who's going to do the governance of the recovery? Should it be European, American, or Ukrainian? And this group is very effective, very functional. And the example is that there's joint secretariat and there are people who are trusted both on the part of international community and domestically. So on April 19th, we came up with the paper. We released the paper on sanctions roadmap. On May 9, uh, we have a paper on energy sanctions roadmap. And some of this, uh, as you have seen, the oil embargo and now discussions, the price cap uh, has been implemented. Uh, individual sanctions uh, in, on June 14th and financial sanctions on June 22. Now we're talking about the paper on um, state sponsor of terrorism. So uh, the way we do it, uh, we think very carefully about uh, what other countries are proposing and trying to synchronize that. We generate new ideas, and then we try to estimate before and after imposing the sanctions, uh, the effect on the Russian economy, and then we advocate the sanctions. So um, this is basically a research-based, evidence-based uh, reasoning, uh, rather than political reasoning, with a very clear set of goals in mind, uh, which culminates in a sanction proposal. Uh, and it uh, estimates or evaluates effects and outcomes and pro propose mitigation for the costs for the countries imposing the sanctions also gives alternative uh, options. So it's, it's really uh, policy, academic and informed policy. Um, the all papers uh, have this uh, four uh, elements, but the, I guess uh, they are trying to identify weaknesses and leverage uh, for Russia. So they are targeted. They're trying to not just say, oh, you know, we're going to impose a price cap or we're going to designate and no there is a reason in why because we're trying to we're searching constantly for the weaknesses in in the russian economy or in the political situation try to leverage them and we are trying to maximize the cost and create this differential because between imposing the cost and reducing the cost for the countries so here are the sanction objectives i guess this is perhaps one of the most important points that i want to make 
We want to make the war costly for Russia. Sanctions is a part of a war. You know, we are having economic warfare. We're having cyber warfare, informational, geopolitical, and the kinetic, uh, kinetic warfare in Ukraine on the battlefield is only a part of that. It's, it's also the war of symbols. It's the war of persuasion. It's the war of uh, support and unification. So, so it's, it's, it's uh, going to be uh, in some way uh, the war or in which those who are more committed and whose morale is higher will win. Therefore, uh, the point of sanctions is to punish Russia too. And that's the original political motivation. But it cannot be the entire story because you just want to punish for what has been in the past. That's not sustainable. They should be forward looking objectives. The immediate objective is to reduce capacity for Russia to finance and conduct the war, to produce military equipment, to be able to pay salaries or to buy military and defense equipment outside of the country. But the sanctions have to be designed in such a way that it prevents futures wars, in particular by uh, Russia, on the uh, physical, uh, technological level. So it takes this capacity not only immediately for the war, but we make sure that politically and economically, Russia cannot start another war five years from now. Even if we, uh, this war is over, Russia over the last two decades has demonstrated the pattern of starting smaller or bigger wars and annexations across the territory around them. And also in Syria. So outside, sufficiently far from, from the, but we also want to, uh, this is a pilot in some sense, to prevent other countries from using force to change the territories and next countries or invade. So what the lessons learned here should uh, prevent uh, um, war, future wars by aggressive non-democratic regimes or democratic regimes for that matter. And finally, there is a collective action problem and a, a lot of scandal. You know, it's really scandalous how Germany, for example, or the EU more generally has become dependent on Russia over time for energy and some other supplies. Uh, Ukraine after 2014 has been able in two years to divest itself from Russian dependence on gas. If Ukraine can do it, so could have done the EU, but the EU has not. Now we see they can make a lot of progress over the very short period of time. If there is will, there is action. It's just the will was not there. So the sanctions also have to motivate the EU and other countries to think strategically about sustainable independence of non-democratic regimes um, economically so that we don't find ourselves in vulnerable positions down the road. So uh, these are the main groups. You can go to either the, uh, a Twitter at Sanction Group or go to the Stanford page or KC's uh, page. They're all listed here. They will be on the record. Uh, but um, we provide over, there are over 35 memos, policy briefs and articles uh, on design. And we issue position papers before meetings to uh, advocate a better choice of sanctions. Now I'm going to talk about the uh, the the uh, state des designation of Russia of the state sponsor of terrorism for the last one or two minutes. This is, of course, symbolic. And that's when we talk about peace in Ukraine. Everyone, we're all searching for peace. We should ask the question what peace means. This really means not the end of hostilities of military, but that's how most people think. Most people say, oh, you know, we need to start, stop these people shooting. You know, we, we need to stop people, prevent them from shooting at each other. But what we have seen in Bucha, what we've seen in Izum, what we have seen in Kharkiv and Kyiv, in Mariupol, is that there are abuses of human rights, there are war crimes, there is torture and terror in the territories controlled by Russia. There are elements of genocide, there's deportation, but even in Crimea, over the last eight years, what they have done, they have brought, the Crimea is, is population is about 1 million people, you know, they give it or take. What they have done, they brought additional 800,000 people from Russia and they created incentives for people to live, for Crimean Tatars and ethnic Ukrainians and other ethnic Greeks to live, uh, uh, to live Crimea. Some left for Ukraine, some emigrated elsewhere, some were deported to Russia. Some were, and many leaders were put in prison 
and then moved to Russian prisons where they are being tortured, abused, put in solitary confinement. So Russia is actually actively running depopulation and repopulation project in Crimea. And they are doing the same in other territories they control. On top of that, on top of that, they are constantly harassing civilian population in the territories which are controlled by Ukraine through missile attacks, destroying schools, shopping malls, blowing up uh, electricity grids. Recently, they started blowing up dams in Krivoy Rig. In Krivoy Rig. So this really, this really satisfies the definition of terrorism because it's a politically motivated action against non-combatants. It also satisfies the elements of the definition of genocide. Elements, not all the way, but elements, especially with deportation of children and systemic rape. So for us, peace has the meaning of stopping that rather than stopping shooting. We want that to stop, and that's what we are fighting for. So Russia has to be designated to be the state because it's right. It's the right thing to do. There are currently countries like Cuba, Cuba and Iran, and they're really doing much less damage to politically motivated to non-combatants than Russia is doing. So either they have to be taken off the list or Russia has to go on the list. And that would have effects. The effects would be easier secondary sanctions, the ability to sue and confiscate assets, um, a major uh, ban on exports to, to Russia and trade, and uh, a ban on uh, working with financial system with anything state related. Um, the US is opposed to this, the administration. And we have been having recently private meetings with the state, with the State Department, I mean, um, in, in DC. And we are not convinced as the KEC team that their arguments are anything but the desire to keep more control because they're saying that, oh, you know, we can do everything which state designation, designation of the state sponsor of terrorism would do. We can do everything individually and it's up at the discretion of the administration. Now, we don't want it to be at the discretion of administration. We want it to be done. And we also to the message to be sent to the world because truth matters. And if the largest sponsor of terrorism, actually the terrorist state today is Russia, we have to say that. We should not be shy and put in North Korea there and uh, Cuba and Iran, who relative to what Russia does today, look like nothing really, frankly. Furthermore, Russia is not doing it only to Ukrainians. If you look at the patterns of summary executions and civilians graves, we have seen the same done by Wagner in Mali earlier this spring, in March, in April 2022, I think, uh, and the previous year, where they accused French of executing civilians while they really planted them. So they have the same pattern outside of Ukraine. They're really sponsoring terrorism through private, and they are hiring prisoners at, at the, the Wagner group. We all read that they're hiring prisoners and everyone is laughing at this and saying, oh, you know, they're running out of soldiers. No, they're they are hiring prisoners because they want to hire rapers and murderers. They're hiring sadists who could do to other humans things unimaginable for a normal, normal person. So we have to admit that, we have to declare that, and we have to work on preventing that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Timothy. Uh, Timothy, it's very important that you brought uh, a very important aspect, which is the reputational sanctions. So not only the economic sanctions, oil, gas, and so on, which we have been discussing for six months now, but also this aspect, because we see that crimes are still ongoing on the battlefield, that uh, people suffer, civilians suffer, the children suffer. And with this, I would again, please ask you to donate for good cause. You see the QR code on the top. And with this, I would also like to invite our um, uh, journalist, Bartis um, Kocheko, um, to, uh, to please ask your question from the OCO Press um, to our audience. Thank you so much. Uh, sure, thank you for, for the invitation. I, uh, I very much appreciate it. Uh, so uh, my, uh, and, uh, Yes. Yeah, so, 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 so I thought 
I would ask first something that I think that like sort of the general public uh, is um, is most um, concerned with. Uh, I think uh, Lukas Rahel mentioned uh, the first wave of financial sanctions didn't really sort of there, 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 there was I think there was uh, you know the expectations were higher sort of that the, the the thing that you know people expected uh, a full-scale economic collapse of Russia right away but with uh, uh, it didn't happen and then we, we had this case of, uh, of uh, the, the, the strong ruble and people were sort of you know um, um, uh, well, well, the, the 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 Russian narrative started to work that that, that the sanctions don't really don't really hurt the Russian economy that much, but I think it's it's it, it really uh, as as I see it uh, in Polish sort of public opinion, I think it starts to um, to change. What I would uh, with the diminishing, diminishing uh, revenues uh, from uh, from uh, Russian uh, energy exports, etc. And I, I, I would like to ask you, what do you think is the point where, I mean, is it, is it even possible if, if, like, uh, or probable, let's say, um, that we can expect a full-scale uh, collapse of Russian economy? And what would such collapse look like? That's my question. Thank you so much. Um, Lucas, Ben, maybe you could jump in and take this question. Okay, uh, okay, let, let me say a few words and then I guess Lukas, I think probably has pretty similar views so we can sort of complement each other. Um, I wanna come back to the um, issue of expectations, I guess, um, I've already said this in my remarks before. Um, yeah, we, we wanna be a bit careful not to generate sort of um, um, unrealistic expectations. And I think to a certain extent, um, you know, what happened um, in, in February um, and early March and so on was just that the expectations were unrealistic. I mean, the the fr from the, the type of sanctions that were implemented, I think it was just unrealistic to expect a, an immediate collapse of the Russian economy. And in a sense, I think um, what we've seen, at least you know, in retrospect, it's always easy to rationalize things, but. Is, is kind of exactly what you'd expect from sort of textbook economics, which is um, of the effects of these kind of sanctions, um, which is sort of effects that sort of kick in slowly over time, take some time and you gotta be patient. And then the other thing Lukas has already said this um, is, I mean, some of the sanctions sort of weren't really immediately implemented. In fact, they were just like sort of announced. So, so, so these are, uh, uh, oil embargo in particular, um, and it, I mean, still not really operational. Um, and, you know, I think that involved some sort of perverse effects that maybe people didn't think enough about, right? The idea that you can sort of announce we're going to cut off Russian oil in, um, you know, seven months from now, um, uh, uh, and then sort of somehow prices and revenues are going to start falling immediately, or I don't know what people were thinking was, was just kind of wrong. Instead, you know, what you saw is kind of exactly, again, standard economics is, <clears throat> you know, you say we're not going to um, allow you to buy this stuff anymore six months from now. So then people went and bought more of it now, and that drove up prices uh, temporarily. But I mean, those prices then um, over time started, uh, 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 you know, coming down again. So I think Lukash also already said this. I think so far the picture is pretty consistent. The sanctions are working. Um, it just requires some patience. And if anything, everything I've seen so far is um, the reason why sometimes they look like they're not working and, and uh, you know, energy revenues say have increased is because some of the sanctions are frankly a bit half-hearted. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so then the the lesson from that is I think you should tighten the sanctions regime. Um, and then if that happens, um, yeah, I, I guess Tumofi said it, um, you know, maybe sometime in the in the in the spring of 23 or or maybe even later, you'll see uh, start seeing the 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 effects on the Russian budget and, and government revenue and so on. And I'd be pretty confident about that. 
Thank you. Um, eventually, we would like, um, oh no, Lukas, please, sorry. Do, do you have something to add to what Benjamin said? Yeah, so maybe just a couple of quick points. So I think, you know, in terms of what happened in, in February and March, um, I think we were in the, we were in a situation where th there could have been strong nonlinear effects. I mean, as it is always with this sort of financial crisis type of events, you know, there could be some tipping points beyond which uh, the economy behaves very nonlinearly, if you like. And uh, uh, as I said in my opening uh, kind of presentation, I think the policy response has been strong because Russia has been preparing for this uh, for this invasion for some time, and I think. Uh, you know, th th that policy response countered the, the initial financial sanctions. And then subsequently, as Ben was saying, there was much of the, well, the revenue inflows into Russia for the next six months were at record high. And so on top of the preparations pre-war, they have been building up a war chest of money uh, in, the last, in the last few months. I think now the situation will be, start, will be changing quite, quite dynamically. So already the numbers uh, on the fiscal balance, the latest numbers are, are look very, very much worse than the than what it looked like in the first six months. Um, and again, it's uh, it's it's a tricky business in terms of forming these ex expectations because I completely agree that uh, we don't want to form these false expectations only to be fighting the view that sanctions don't work if we if we kind of you know under deliver uh, on these on these promises. At the same time. It is possible, I think, that uh, that uh, as, as as Jeff is, uh, and as Timothy have been saying, that the changes over the next few months are going to be quite rapid. Once the energy embargo kicks in, if the price cap is implemented and it, it and turns out to work, that there might be you know uh, fast changes uh, on the ground. And we see pockets of collapse at the moment, as I showed in my in in my graphs, um, and it's. It, it's very hard. It's a very hard job to kind of try to predict when these pockets are going to spill over to the to to all of the economy. What I think is much more certain is that longer term prospects are just very grim. I think you know, being the West being completely independent from Russian energy on the one hand, coupled with Russia being completely cut off from modern technology uh, and trade on the other, is a very powerful combination that in the long term. Uh, you know, our, my my expectations for for Russia are very are very dire, but I completely realize that you know that the primary objective of the sanctions is is to stop the war here and now. Although, as we've been talking about, the secondary longer term objectives are also very important. Thank you so much. So eventually, one of the outcomes is um, long term. Any long term is basically does mean that there are people dying every day still. So, what are the effects of the sanctions so far on the battlefield? Have you seen any variation, any impact? Maybe Jeffrey, Timothy, you could say it, um, uh, referring to effects on logistics, on tanks um, production, and so on, maybe. Well, it, uh, again, I'll d defer to Timothy as a, a, one of the economic experts on this panel, but I, we would, uh, you know, point out uh, consistent with Lukasha's research uh, that, um, uh, say, looking at the auto industry as he as he did on that very powerful graph, uh, very powerful data, how that has crumbled. We we have seen that uh, the the imports, uh, as as uh, you know, Benjamin has talked about. Uh, for, uh, and auto imports uh, look like, you know, there, there, weren't, there weren't that many people that we're ever going to meet in our lifetime who own or drive a Russian car to start with. So uh, Lukash's crash of internal production is encouraging to see. Uh, but uh, what's even, I think, more uh, profound is, uh, as Benjamin would remind us, is the collapse of um, of uh, car sales uh, that 95% of Russians drive non-Russian made cars for reasons of quality, safety, and style. Uh, and uh, we recreated that data because the way we got our data, wherever Russia was the seller, we went to the buyer, wherever Russia was the buyer, we went to the seller. We saw that 95% of auto uh, makers uh, have stopped their, imp you know, imp the, the sales in, in Russia, there's some existing inventory in stock that some dealers have there to sell to sell down. But uh, that's just one of many. I would also point out as an aside on the aviation data, it's not as great as we would love it to be. We we have the data, We uh, which I don't know, Stephen, you, you have it, this one, you probably don't at your fingertips, but we could tell you at, at any moment 
how many S7 and Aeroflot airplanes are in service. And it's almost as many as there were uh, beforehand. And that's a little disappointing. Uh, there are some that are, are being harvested for aviation parts, but somebody, I don't want to, on a public call here, name the country that might be having a surge of aviation parts orders that they don't need for their domestic uh, airlines, but are providing Aeroflot and, and S7 some um, uh, some aviation parts. So somebody's cheating. So there is going to always be some uh, uh, some cheating, some leakage, uh, but you uh, you uh, you can't uh, you know run an economy that is uh, that is uh, uh, based on um, some uh, some degree of, of 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 cheating that way. That these are highly uh, uh, expensive uh, parts that are leaking in, just like getting a replacement part for an Apple iPhone screen. You can get it. Uh, but the the aviation leak it is is disturbing, and candidly, Airbus could be doing more. Uh, some of Boeing's parts are being uh, uh, are, are are circumventing sanctions uh, by third parties. But uh, Airbus is openly still buying Russian titanium for air part manufacturing. Boeing is not. There's alternative sources for titanium, and there should be a lot more pressure by you know everybody on this call and all the relatives we know to come down on um, on Airbus's uh, inability to support the EU and the rest of the world uh, fully on this front. And as a small area, uh, but of some concern, Mideast Airlines are, and Air Serbia and some others, but especially the Mideast Airlines are still flying into Russia, but also flying over Russia, which is giving an awful lot of money to Russia on overflight fees that should be condemned actively and I'm I'm frustrated by that. It's largely European and American passengers on those Mid East airlines that are flying to uh, Asian routes, so whether or not it's in uh, Korea or China or or uh, Japan that are flying over uh, Philippines that are flying over. These are the most profitable routes for for European and and U.S. air carriers that they've had to give up to Middle Eastern carriers because it adds roughly two to three hours to the flight time and a lot more fuel costs uh, and are more expensive. So of course, a rational passenger from the US or the EU is now flying on a Middle Eastern carrier that is supporting Putin's war machine. Somehow this has to be addressed as well, but I don't wanna go on too long a rant on this, but the Middle Eastern air carriers uh, and Airbus need to be addressed on on uh, the sanctions issues. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Timothy. Yeah, um, I agree with Jeff. I'll just compliment. Um, we'll be quick. Um, this Shahrazad uh, drones from Iran, which run under Iran two name in Russia now. These are Iranian drones, and they are very precise, and they are a threat, a real threat, and they take out the. US and uh, EU provided long range artillery. Explain to me how is one of the most sanctioned countries in the world has high tech equipment? Someone is trading something somewhere. Okay. But it's also a sign that sanctions are working because Russia is not capable of producing it domestically. So this leakage and bypassing of sanctions really has very specific structural paths that have to be targeted and it is possible to do. And there is cheating and we are still seeing European companies equipment in uh, recently repaired tanks or produce tanks from Russia. So that means that some European companies continue to supply things, maybe directly, maybe indirectly, through third parties to Russia, and not only finance the war, but also actively enable the war and enable killing civilians. And so they are also guilty. 
So that has to be addressed, and that's why it's an ongoing battle. But there are also signs, like with the Shahir yeah, with this Giran two <laughs> drone, that um, sanctions are working. Yeah, I'm very glad you spoke about the bypassing of sanctions. I think this is a whole topic for itself. So uh, the fact that for, uh, companies are pretending that they are helping Ukraine, the, then the fact that they go over third countries, and then the fact that they're not only going and producing Adidas or whatever over third countries, but they also actually also allow Russia to buy weapons. And so this needs to be addressed as obvious a loophole. Um, in the interest of time, I would like to thank everyone. It has been a great discussion and I would like to um, hand over to our co-organizer, Christian Pranio, uh, to a close up. Um, thank you so much to everyone. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Alexander. Uh, I mean, first of all, I would like to uh, thank you all the panelists, all the people in the audience for participating in this uh, great conversation. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, the war of uh, Russia and Ukraine is one of the most tragic uh, events, probably the most tragic and probably one of the most uh, important event in recent times and that is likely to also shape what will come in the next uh, decades, not only in, in, in Russia and in, in, in Europe, but around the world. And um, I think that even though we had this, this yeah, mostly economics-based uh, discussion, I particularly value the, the opinions and the, the view of Timothy, who actually, you know, basically brought down or brought our attention to the fact that we're actually talking about lives. We're talking about uh, about dramas. We're talking about uh, about uh, acts of, of inhumanity uh, that are being, <clears throat> um, yeah, are being uh, done by by the Russian uh, army in Ukraine, and that's something that really. Uh, needs to be stressed even more and even and of course the for for people who are not uh, in 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 Ukraine uh, these issues tend to be a little bit far away in, in especially in, in Europe and in France and Germany and these countries people are worried about electricity and about heating and so on but at the end of the day uh, I think it is our responsibility even though we are economists uh, it is our responsibility to really uh, bring the attention to what is actually important in this, in this whole conversation. And um, of course, you know, misinformation is a feature of war. This has been the case throughout the years. And that is why uh, scholarly and research-based uh, opinions and arguments are so important. And that's why I think that panels like the ones, uh, uh, like, like, like the one that we have set up here are so important because we have been able to bring together uh, most, uh, or, or, yeah, some of the most renowned uh, scholars in this area around the world, and uh, yeah, and we have had a great conversation. So again, thank you very much, everybody. Please, uh, again, um, I would like to uh, you to uh, bring your attention to the PayPal QR code uh, that is on top of the of the streaming and also in the description of the of the um, video on YouTube. And besides that, well, I hope uh, that. Uh, you stay safe, uh, of course, that this war is uh, over as soon as possible. And uh, yeah, thank you very much uh, in the name of Freundschaft Kind of Thank you. Thank you.